Okay. Getting it going out on Facebook here as well. <clears throat> okay, so we got people rolling in here. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Green Cover webinar. This is the last in our series of I believe six or seven that we've done this fall. And uh, uh, we're excited to have uh, a really good one to end on. They've all been really good, but this is going to be uh, very appropriate and very timely uh, with the situation that we find ourselves in with high fertility prices. So I think everybody that is either watching this live or will be watching it later on YouTube uh, are really going to get a lot of good information here uh, that can potentially save you uh, thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, so it's really good information so that we're, we're glad that you're here. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, if you are uh, wanting to ask a question, uh, you can ask that through the chat uh, tool at the bottom of your screen or on the Q&A. Uh, we will have uh, our presenters uh, go for about 45 minutes, and then we'll leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a good Q&A session as well. So we'll try to cover as many of those questions as possible uh, at the end. So I just want to introduce uh, our panelists, our guests here tonight. Uh, Dr. Richard Mulvaney is with the University of Illinois. Uh, I met Richard a couple of years ago. We were both speaking at a conference out in California. And I heard him present some of what he's going to be presenting uh, here this evening. And I thought, man, that is such good information. We've got to get that out to more people. So uh, uh, we are having him present this uh, tonight. And it really all has to do with nitrogen, nitrogen recommendations, nitrogen utilization in plants, and, and how uh, many of us have probably been over applying nitrogen for uh, uh, quite a while. So uh, we're excited to have Richard on board to share that information with us. And then, uh, Richard, I'm going to let you introduce your colleague, Saeed, because I just met him for the first time here this evening. So go ahead and introduce him as well. Okay. Um, my colleague is Saeed Khan from Pakistan. He's uh, now a resident American citizen. And uh, I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but that's what he is. <laughs> <laughs> and, it depends. <laughs> and, and I, I met him back in the mid 1980s when he came here to do graduate work. And uh, he completed that part of his life in about 1991. And uh, he went back to Pakistan for a couple of years. He was a department head um, over there. And that was in soil fertility. He came back here in the mid 1990s and he started to work in my lab and we worked together for about, well, about 20 years. And uh, he was a very, very valuable colleague and uh, he has great expertise on the topic you'll be covering tonight and that's potassium. So I think you'll benefit from what he has to say. Yeah, so, so you're, so you're gonna get the one, two fertility punch tonight. You're gonna get nitrogen and potassium. So it's going to be it's going to be a really great presentation. So Richard, uh, let's not waste any more time. Go ahead and uh, share your slides there and, and let's uh, get going. I'm going to I'm going to hide my video here so that people uh, can just watch you. OK, Keith, and thanks for giving Saeed and me the chance to share our message on your webinar. And um, I, we kind of put a catchy title on this which is relevant to us especially because it literally took Saeed and myself years to escape some of that futility that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I think I think the best way to begin here is with a is with a quote. I, I don't I don't see your screen yet. I don't think you've shared it. Oh sorry. Okay there we go. 
There we go. Yep, got it. Thanks. So I, I said our title is kind of catchy, and it took Saeed and myself years to uh, escape some of the futility that we'll be telling you about. Maybe the comments we can make tonight will help you get out of it sooner than we did, I hope. And so what I want to do is start with a quote, and that would be from Will Rogers. I don't know if he had soil fertility in mind when he said this, but, but he sure could have. And it, it just makes the point that the problems we face isn't what we don't know, but it's the stuff we know that ain't so. And boy, that is so relevant to the things we'll cover tonight. We're gonna start with nitrogen and uh, go through some slides on that subject. And then, then I'll turn it over to Saeed and he'll tell us about potassium. So on the nitrogen coverage, we'll be asking a series of five basic questions. And the first of those is about as basic as you can get. What is the main source for crop in uptake? And when I pose this question, I'm thinking about corn in particular. So it's gonna have basically two sources to feed on. One would be the fertilizer that is now very expensive. And the other would be from the soil. And that's the point of this figure I'm showing here. I've summarized the yield data from 47 on-farm response trials that were conducted beginning in the early 1990s and going into the early 2000s. And what I've done here is to choose the sites that had not been manured for at least three years before they were studied. We have a total of 47 of these here in, in the figure. And what I'm showing is in the green part of the bar, that is the check yield, the unfertilized yield. And then for the majority of these studies, there's an additional component that's shaded blue here above the green. That would be the additional yield coming from the economically optimum end rate at those sites. So there are 47 of these studies. I've organized them in order of decreasing check yield as you go from left to right. And you might notice that uh, most of the bars do have a blue bar above the green, but there are some that don't. In fact, there are nine of the 47 that have no blue bar. And that's because those were sites where there was no statistically significant yield increase within fertilization. They were what we would call non-responsive. So we look at this set of data and the most important point addressing the question I posed is that the green bars are pretty much all taller than the blue bars when there is a blue bar. In fact, there were only four exceptions to that in this set of 47 data sets. And I've summarized the, the overall picture for this group of sites. The range in optimum end rate was from zero to 210 pounds per acre. The average optimum end rate was only 85 pounds per acre. And that corresponded to an average yield increase of 42 bushels per acre. So from this figure, I hope we can get an answer to the first question that the soil is the main source of N. So the second question I'd like to put up is how does that soil N become available for uptake by a non-leguminous crop like corn? Well, we don't have time to go into the, the details of this. <laughs> this. This is like the subject of a college course, but I'm gonna give it at least one slide here and it kind of puts it in perspective, telling us that the key players are the microbes that live in the soil. Now, I'm not telling you that those microbes look like this figure, okay? But they are the key players. They run the nitrogen cycle. And they consist of bacteria, actinomycetes, and fungi. So collectively, these guys 
can total up to more than 20,000 pounds in the plow layer per acre. And you might equate that to maybe the biomass in something like 15 cows per acre. Their job is to decompose organic residues. And if they didn't do their job, we would be completely over, we would be dealing with a massive accumulation of residues and it would destroy life on earth. These guys recycle that, they cycle nutrients and one of the nutrients that they are crucial to is nitrogen. They make it available through a process called mineralization. So here's the players that make that soil in available. The third question I'm gonna put up is about yield-based N recommendations that have been the norm since the mid 1970s when it came into vogue. It's a very simple approach to making N recommendations. And that's part of the reason why it became so popular. What you do is to take the expected yield goal for corn, multiply it times 1.2, and then deduct from that any appropriate end credits for legumes or manure. Now, the end credits especially pertain to corn soybean rotations with a 40 pound per acre credit for the soybeans. So this method came into use in 1975 was the beginning. It spread throughout the US, many parts of the world. But do you notice here in this simple formula, there's a word that's missing. The word is soil. And we just said that soil was the main source of N for crop uptake. Well, that might lead to some troubles with the recommendations from this proven yield method. And sure enough, it does. Here we're looking at the accuracy of those recommendations for a total of 102 sites. These are on-farm sites. And we're looking at the occurrence where I've grouped the errors in the proven yield recommendation into these different categories and ranges listed here on the x-axis. So the place to be is in the green bar. These are the guys who got the correct end rate to within 20 pounds per acre. Unfortunately, there was only about 20% of the, of the sites that fell into that group. The others were either un, under fertilized in the blue bars or much more commonly, they were over fertilized. And you can see that with the red bars. On average, the recommended end rate for these 102 sites was 138 pounds per acre. But based on the yield response data, the actual optimum end was only 80 pounds, about 60 pounds less than the average recommended end. So we're looking at a method here that promotes over application of N. And it does that because it undervalues the soil and it overvalues the fertilizer. So there's the yield-based approach. It's not the best. So then we look at the more recent option that Extension has come out with in the Midwestern states, and that would be these mandated N recommendations that go by the name of the N rate calculator that is headquartered in, in Iowa State, and it also is called the MRTN system, maximum return to N. They came out with this system as a replacement for the proven yield method, the 1.2 method, uh, going back to 2009. Here's the home page when you go to this website that I've listed here. And to use this, you're gonna be dealing with an economics based recommendation. And so here's the the uh, point of data entry here. You have to choose your region, your state, and the rotation can be either corn soybean or continuous corn. Then you put in some economic numbers down here with the price of the fertilizer you're using. 
Here I've chosen anhydrous ammonia and we put in the corn price here. So what you get is a graph like the one shown here at the lower part of the slide. And you're seeing this gray shaded area that gives you the optimum N recommendation for the conditions that you have specified up here. And in this, we're looking at a corn soybean rotation in central Illinois. And the center of the gray shaded area would be 166 pounds per acre. Now that's coming from a database of past in response trials in the area of interest. That's what the, the basis is for this thing. The big advantage is that it reduces end rates compared to the proven yield method, and it escapes a big problem that extension had where the escalating corn yields were escalating the end rates. They decoupled it with this system, and the impact is shown here in the bar graph. You get lower end rates with the MRTN than you do with the proven yield. Okay, so that part of it's potentially good, but there's a fatal flaw. And the flaw is, again, that the calculator has no way to factor in the soil. It's assuming typical end response from that database of response trials. So I've tried to, to indicate what the consequences are with this figure. The problem is, that if you have a really good soil, say a manured muscatoon that shows almost no end response, almost no effect of fertilizer in on yield, you don't need much in at all, if any. But for other soils, you need more. The curve is showing a steeper slope. But for the MRTN system, they're assuming that all soils respond here in the central arrow. They give it an average recommendation. They make no distinction between a manured muscatoon and an eroded blount. There's no difference. So it means that the good soil, like the one here in green, with their average recommendation gets way too much in. And the poor soil, like the blount here in red, doesn't get enough. So there you go. Manuring isn't factored in it doesn't make much sense considering that soil is so important to supplying the crop. So that brings me to the last question I wanna raise. What about soil science? What can we do to make things better in terms of end recommendations? Well, the system that Said and I worked on is called the Illinois Soil End Test, abbreviated ISNT, and uh, it, it's a very simple test to run. It started out in mason jars and used a pancake griddle for five hours of heating. And the purpose is to estimate the soils and supplying power. We won't go into detail on it, but we have published a number of articles on this. And uh, it basically is measuring an organic source of soil in. Now, when we came up with this back in 2001, we were interested in evaluating it with some on-farm response soils that we had. And here we have 25 of those sites. There were 12 here that were non-responsive and 13 that were responsive over here on the left side of the figure. And we found it was possible uh, to separate the two groups, assuming a critical test value uh, between 225 and 235 parts per million shown here in this green, green uh, shaded area. And to the right of that, we have the soils that did not need N fertilizer. They tested higher. And the ones here to the left that did show a response, they tested lower. And so that was a big deal to us. Uh, this kind of relationship had never been seen with any, with any other soil end test. We did a lot of work on it. We came up with the idea of soil-based end management, recognizing the critical role of the soil in supplying in. The fertilizer is a supplement. It can be an important supplement, but it's still secondary to what the soil supplies. And then the point about poor soils needing more in than good soils 
is exactly the reverse of what yield-based recommendations would teach. They'd put the in on the good soils. We would say, put it on the poor soils to boost their productivity. So we did a lot of work on this, going back some uh, 15 plus years now. And we published a major paper in 2006. And that was exploring the factors that affect recommendations by this soil-based approach. There were many of those factors. One of them was plant population. And we have a little bit of detail on that in the table shown here. We found out there was a fundamental interaction and we're listing here three classes of ISNT going down the first column and two groups of plant population from lower and higher going across the table. And so within a given range of plant population, as you go down the table, you're getting higher IS and T values and you're gonna need less in fertilizer. The soil's better. And then as you go in, stay in a given IS and T range and go across from lower to higher population, you can see you need more in because it takes more in to feed more plants. And with the big increase in planting rates over, over the years, this is a really important interaction. Um, we felt really good about documenting this interaction, but truth is it was known long ago from, from an experiment station bulletin we came across telling us to plant corn thicker if the land is rich, and thinner if the land is old and thin. It's this idea, but now we can put a number on it with the ISNT. The high ISNT areas are the most valuable land you can farm. They give you the option to cut the end rate, you don't need as much fertilizer, or you can boost the plant population to take advantage of higher fertility. And so my last slide on nitrogen gives just a brief summary of the commercial uh, interest in the ISNT. It has been used by several private soil testing firms. Uh, I list two of those here with CropSmith in uh, actually in Farmer City, Illinois, and VH Consulting up in Hudson, Wisconsin. Then I give you three points from Rick Van and Hoovel at VH Consulting, and he's used this extensively in Northern Iowa, and uh, he says that end rate reductions with this ISNT approach typically start out at 25 to 30 pounds per acre, but pretty soon they're up to 50 to 60 with no effect on yield. That many fields will show end recommendations that differ by over 100 pounds per acre in different parts of the field. And finally, many of them have high testing areas where you don't need any N at all. And so he makes the point, and I would second it, that N should be applied variable rate, and this is the way it can be done. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Saeed with potassium. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Keith, and all the listeners for the topic I'm going to give you a couple of slides to explain potassium management. This story is also just like what Richard told you about nitrogen. Just to understand a little bit potassium, let me say something that you won't find this in the books, that potassium exists in three pools, three farms, and they are very much into dynamic with one another. They can go up toward mineral clay, and they can also come from mineral clay to the intermediate clay fixed, non-exchangeable, and then exchangeable. Currently, and also for the last seven decades, they are using just a small fraction of exchangeable K. But this, they assume that the exchangeable K is a static amount. They just stay as exchangeable K, but this is not the case. Potassium is completely different from nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus because it exists. All farm exists as inorganic N. And when they are inorganic N and they K. don't need K potassium and they also stay as a potassium 
they never become organic like amino acid, amino sugar, or phospholipids. They always stay as inorganic and they can go and they can, and they're also water soluble. They are not really any, we don't need any microbes to, to change mineral K into exchangeable. So this is a very dynamic. It can increase any time and it can be, go back if you put fertilizer or any come from plant or any residues. They go back to the mineral K. So, but soil testing is made just exchangeable potassium. But ignore the waste K reserves that supply the exchangeable fractions. Next. Now, to tell the point, this is one of my PhD plot. There were six plot. This is the zero plot. Drummer soil, very rich. Corn soil being rotation. They have never been applied K since 1970. And I start working in, in 86 on this, in March 1986. So I'm just showing you how dynamic it is. I remove the potassium exchangeable soil test in year 86. And then I have the samples. I also took that sample. I were talking bi-weekly samples from six plots on a moist basis and air dry basis. So I went to those samples and I remove the exchangeable K and then take the same soil and remove uh, uh, extracted non-exchangeable K with successive extraction with HNO3. And I would be just take out the same soil. I was not throwing anything in a test tube and put 10 ml of nitric acid, one normal for 10 minutes and shake it and then take out the upper solution and keep the soil. And if you take extraction number one, and 96, I removed 214, then followed by extraction number 1936 pounds per acre. The next was 550. And I'm talking about this is just within an hour. I'm doing per hour, per hour like this. And 550, 413, and then it's become 313, 225, and 213. So I remove, I'm showing here one to six, but I extracted up to 12. I was naive at that time. I thought I can dark down the whole non-exchangeable. I spent all night, I couldn't do it. So I went to the 86 and the same sample, but in different time, the same plot, 218 exchangeable and then follow the, the full extraction. Look at 26, 96, the same amount, a little bit, it's not going down. Then I went 88 and then extraction number one and two and, and all the to 29, 26. This was a little bit up because 88 was a very drought year. And you can reflect that 1000 first extraction, non-exchangeable. It was not going toward the plant, but it was just, there was no water. So if you see this non-exchangeable is so dynamic and so huge, it's an ocean. And that created problem for their exchangeable testing. They don't take into account. And remember that. This soil has been depleted for 13 years and then four years more, 16 years. It was a mining two crops per, per year. And then it's not going down. Next. Okay, and I also are doing a bi-weekly sampling on the same plot, which I, I show you. I would go bi-weekly in 86 and I was going up to 90. Look at here, the lower, the, the, the chaos and the disturbance and the cyclic nature. In winter, they will go up because water was more and they will come out from the non-exchangeable to exchangeable, both wet and dry both. And then when crop would come in April, they would go down, it's a cyclic. So one should be very careful if you are doing exchangeable care testing or six inches with, even today they are doing it. You are wasting time and every, week by weekly, there's a different number. And then the main difference I'm showing you that when I started the check plot in 86 March was somewhere in 150, the lower line. This is my sample. Is the, what, how much moisture is 20%, 15%, 16%, 22%. And I would measure the moisture and do the test and then take the same sample and do dry testing. And you, you see the drive is always higher 50. And as time goes by, it's increasing. 
despite of the fact that we are mining it for the last 13 years. Why it's increasing? I will explain later on that. Next one. So in order to check my data, I went to the literature at that time. That is any other people in the Midwest, similar soil two to one and you know similar kind of series. So if you see moist soil is always lower than the dry soil pounds per acre. The difference is always the dry soils increase when you dry them. The moist soil increase when you dry them. So you're creating an artificial level, which is not the true plant seed. But why it's increasing? Because non-exchangeable when you dry, the, the clay water is coming out and it's bring internal non-exchangeable and put it right into the dry soil because they are coming out from moist inside the clay and they bring extra uh, potassium and that's why you get a plus. So if you have very close number, that means you are putting too much fertilizer, you collapse the clay. That's not a good, like, like fire. 140, 144, that guy is under the influence extension and he is putting a lot of KCL and he's collapsing his clay. That already, I, I will show you the slide. You change the clay nature from non, from a swelling to a tight elite and you change smectite. That's not a good news. I will show a little bit more, talk about this next. And the reason I was doing it because the, the, the extension was, and tester was saying that we have problem, give us a fudge factor. I said, there is no fudge factor. Every number is different. So I'll behave differently. This is another soil that I told you I was doing my for, for PhD on six plot. So it's 1970, 83, and they were putting zero K, potassium and then K2O and then 50, 100, 150, 200, 250. And then I, I'm showing you the data, uh, here all the data. I took some sample in January, February on biweekly sampling from deep plot and dry it and put it in a bag and then put it in the lab. And after, in March, after two months, I retested those samples. And look at this 370 is changed, it's decreased by 106. So they are so dynamic that a little bit moisture from the ear in the lab, nothing is the field, it's in the lab. And look at this, how unstable this and how fast an exchange is. In the lab, they re-equilibrate itself and I, I get all minus value, which initial number was. So the exchangeable K is wasting of time. They only generate revenue for the soil tester. And I don't know how I interpret it for fertilizer recommendation because they never say about what kind of the critical level is and how they recommend it. They say, always put fertilizer above the critical level, which violate the soil testing philosophy. Next one. Now, if you see, we are doing all things, testing and everything on the floor layer, but I'm showing you that how plant behave with the roots. Six inches is not the, the soil, it's a flow, which is. So the subsoil is a major source of K, crop uptake, but soil testing confined to flow layer and look at this flow layer is 250 exchangeable, profile is 300 and the roots are all going about profile, not just the six inches. Six inches is always two or three inches are dry. I don't know if they can supply anything to the plant. And microbes also go away if it's nitrogen or other, but potassium and every nutrient, microbes and all other water, this is dry in hot summer. So that's not important. The flow there is very important. Now, non-exchangeable, how much is there? Look at this 1,000. And I show you sex extraction almost approaching 3,000 in a good soil. And profile is 12,000. And then 30 is the six inches for mineral and 360,000 is for the flow layer. It's a lot of potassium. How you can benefit it from one or two or three bags per acre? I don't get it, this philosophy. Plant don't need it. It's a self that God designed this system as self fertilization. Yeah. He knew it. And why it is, if you look potassium, it's involved in 400 plus micro the processes tomato control water control uh, taking it's like a food from the leaf toward the grain store it it's all done by potassium 
plant and uh, even our system cannot wait for that they should change the mineral into uh, uh, our organic potassium. There is no organic potassium. There is everything is soluble mineral. It can quickly go and do the job. Next one. This is also the importance of profit cap take because a lot of crops, they when they you are harvesting and you put residues, the K is recycled. And the recycle is very high, five, six times more than what you remove in the grain. 260 K content in the whole plant and, and, and per, per, per acre. And we look at it, the grain removal is 46 per bushel, but Strauer put it five times more. And that exactly what I show you in my five years of study of taking sample, they were increasing without adding fertilizer. This was the source of fertilization from subsoil and residue recycling. And it's water soluble as the rain comes, they just go out. And that's the reason that you get a lot of noise in the data, up and down, up and down. This is the source. That's it. Now, in order to show you that how you cannot measure the, the, the inputs and outputs on the basis of flow layer, six inches. This is the data from Maro plant. We know how much we put and we know how much we removed from the, from the yield. And now the net change would be what in soil testing if you take six inches sample for exchangeable. Look, there are two plots side by side. We added zero in a check plot in Maro plot. And the other one got 1,829. Cumulative carry mool was 796 from the check plot, zero, and 1511 was from the other one. Net change minus 96, but that's not the case. Look at this, the next soil K, six inches. Initial was 215 and it's increased. It's become now 362. The net change was plus, not negative. And then the same is the case with K removed in the, when we put fertilizer, we added 1511 pounds and then we got net change should be 318 but the initial was 215 for both. And look, there also you got plus where it's coming from. For both plots, the majority of N is recycled and coming from the subsoil. And it's so much that you will never get any deficiency K. I will show you that later on. Now, this is, I say, it's, we are doing in Maro plot here or it's anywhere in the world too. We went to the lot of data and dig out these uh, long-term trials four years, 40 years, 100 years. And look at this study period, China, Denmark, Germany, India, New England, Poland. And the studies period and K removed in different crops. We calculated that and initial was this number. And then the final was this number and the negative change was that. But if you remove the K, the column K removed and then the net change, look at how misleading the K testing is. And particularly the power in Germany, look at this 1914 to 1975, it's also a drummer type two to one molecule. We removed 4,046 and initial was 141 and the final is 110. And the net chain is min minus 31. Where is coming from? Subsoil and residue uh, recycling. And our, and farmers just, afraid, they are so nervous that they would lose and they would lose their everything. It's not the case. That's why I'm showing again and again that it's an ocean of potassium. You don't need that two or three, four bags. You are just wasting your money and destroying your crop. Next, Richard. Okay, this is a very important <coughs> uh, slide here. In the books, they say that if you are below uh, 300, uh, 250, that was their, their critical, 300, this red, critical level. Look at this, this is a 40 acre plot in Illinois, close to our office. It's a Flanagan or drummer, drummer and Maliso and under corn and soybean rotation. And I'm showing you the, the test level. It is from 183 on the X axis and then you have 800, the, these all test level go up and down, but look, the 
the the the yield is exactly 170 plus and minus very close so they tell me that k has no bearing with so much case cup this is a non exchangeable exchangeable on the basis of 6 inches but all they are coming from and that is k is not static that it would stay as 300 it's increasing and decreasing look at this from the test and they are getting from non exchangeable for mineral and also the exchangeable is changing from 160 to 800 but the yield is not affected no nope. they don't need it and the correlation is 0 0.015 nothing it's just a it's a loser proposition here and they say in the agronomy handbook from these you know see that is 80 percent good test so i don't know if this is 80 percent what would be <laughs> they are zero <laughs> next one okay this is the marrow plot again i'm showing you to the farmer to the grower that hey you don't need potassium this is a check plot since 140 years and we go every year richard and me and check that can we give some browning on the edges that we can tell that this is potassium you can get nitrogen yes you cannot grow for 140 years without nitrogen and we remove 4200 pounds when this data was collected in 2014 and we are still observing this every year look at this no sign of k deficiency and nothing we always observe this and we are showing to the farmers who are listening that hey you should take a scientific approach we are encouraging you you don't need potassium next now let's go and we calculated that if you take a corn remove 0.2 pounds two three pounds of k per bushel so 200 bushel will remove 46 pounds of k a typical Illinois soil contains 3,000 pounds K in the flow layer, which I show you my slide, and then 360 pounds in the profile. Enough K in the flow layer for 650 years, just six inches. And if you go further and calculate on the profile, which is actual profile, is that doing supply in stuff. 8,000 year of K supply in the profit. So in biblical term, you will go in the time of Abraham. Moses was 4,000, Jesus was 2,000 something, and even then you won't see any deficiency. So what your potassium is going, you are wasting your time. And in particularly this year, that nitrogen is 1,400 per ton, and pota the potassium is 900 or 1,000. They are very close to now, and don't waste your money. Follow and reduce your inputs. Next one. Now I went to India. This is all I'm showing, you know, that whatever it was a soil, 200 big, the settler came and they, they, they started one crops and sometimes two crops. They are not taking, this is India. This is not Molly soil. These are all soil. And they are there uh, for the last five or 6,000 years, they are exploiting. India agriculture is completely different from the United States and Canada because they take everything, not grain, everything under the sun from their fields for burning, for use other stuff, for feeding the cows and everything. So 8,800 trial conducted in 72, 74, after five, six years, thousand years of exploitation with rice and wheat on different soil type. And like what they found, K responses were rare, and did not exceed 30 pounds K per acre on soil, where they are feeding for the last five years, 5,000 year, four crops, and one billion, one, more than 1 billion, 1 billion and 200 population. Yield was depressed in several trials because you put KCL, it will depress. I will discuss that later. Soil test alone is not sufficient. That's the conclusion of Goswami. It's a good science. And sufficient to predict the response are those of potassium fertilizer to be applied. Don't use exchangeable. Okay. No, it's not working. Yes. Okay, so this is now the trials. It's a, we collected some with corn soybean grain production, more than 2,100 response trial with KCL. Eight, close to 800 were cash grain production in North America. 4% show a significant yield increase. Why? Because it was under sandy soil. 
or it was shallow soil, or it was compacted soil. They are all, the roots are restricted to the six inches, not yield. So if you do this, let me explain in a, in a, in a medical term. If anybody, doctor, which is a heart surgeon, and he come and you go there, and you say, hey, 800 people came, heart problem, and I operated at him. Only 4% went to, the house, to their house, and the remaining are all dead. I don't know about the farmer, but I will run from their place right away. Yeah, I'm not staying, and I'm not going to their surgeon to have my heart problem. Next one. Now, this is a recent study. One of our students was conducted. In, in close to the, our uh, farm. And it say soybean yield, the data was showing under nortil, strip till, they were all depressed in, under different tillage condition. And so that means chloride, particular chloride and potassium too, they depress various crop to different, a different level. And in this slide, we're clearly showing it. You will lose not money, but also depress which is the hidden cost. People don't say the hidden cost of KCL application. Next. This is another slide. Potassium suppressed nitrate because they are both negative and plant, if you have chloride, chloride with suppressed nitrate uptake. Now you spend 1400 on the nitrogen, hydrous ammonia, and you put almost the, 93 pounds now, if you calculate 150 pounds, 93 cents per almost one dollar. And then you also buy 775 dollar per tons of KCL. So you are both buying it with your own stuff due to the propaganda of this extension and university recommendation. And chloride depressed nitrate, when it's ready to take by the plant, what is going to leach? Because chloride is more powerful, they occupy the vacuum, the storage in the plant, and nitrate go away. And chloride also interferes with carbohydrate production. And then chloride, main thing is inhibit notification. Bacteria don't like chloride. Yeah, it's what also, and look the data. It's a lot of stuff is, you know, and it's significantly decreased if you see the R number there. 0.75 significant. So chloride, and then you are doing with your own wrong information. Next. Now, there is also, they say that potassium is a very good thing. It increased quality of this, everything. And we went and we took out 1400 free trials. We survey and they were only given KCL. And 55, 7% show a beneficial effect and mostly on those soil, which was sandy somewhat are compacted, but 55 show a detrimental effect. And the effect was that if you have more potassium, chloride in the potassium, cadmium is not taken up by the plant, but if become cadmium chloride, it goes pretty fast to these malting barley and potato. And what cadmium that, do, it will clog your filter that is kidney. If you are drinking a uh, barley came out from the, and treated with chloride and potato like Idaho, you are getting in trouble if you are taking all these French fries and, and potatoes also very much, it reduces the specific gravity, the denseness, and it's become porous. And when you are doing these uh, oil can take chips and fries, they are loaded because they have a lot of holes. And then also heart problems. And the same is calcium magnesium deficiency in forage grasses. All these people who are in that business, they know it, that we get a milk flea fever and tetany because potassium go fast as compared to calcium and magnesium. And that's why our food is always, you know, bone fracture, woman hell, and all kinds of stuff. Potassium, high potassium created, you are putting. And then human diet low in calcium, also not good for your bones especially in old age. So that is a hope they're saying that it's a qualitative thing. No, no, it's not. Next. Now, this is very important. When you are applying potassium indiscriminately, like under the recommendation of build up level, put more, put more, then you are changing your mineralogy. You are changing a, a, a very porous, 
which can go back and forth with the water. They have more water holding capacity. They have roots can penetrate, go access to exchangeable potassium. You compact it because potassium is like a nail. They collect it, they go back in mineralogy, make it non-swelling. So you will be always uh, suffering from drought because you nail, you compacted your soil. And also you lose cation exchange capacity, more leaching, water holding capacity. So you are changing the quality of your soil with more K. Don't do it. Instead of putting calcium, they will open up your soil. Now, who invented this, this hoax? At which we call it paradox. So you can decide after that. There is a paradox, and it's really science. This was done across Illinois on 30 or uh, 40 experimental stations for 30, 40 years. And what they found, the dot show a journal, but now mean close relationship between the increase in yield and the exchangeable potassium content of surface side. No, no relation. That was brain. Good, good chemist. But I don't know why they didn't take his advice. And suddenly in 70, next one, a very different recommendation system on the basis of exchangeable care, pound per pound, very nice. Uh, you can get increased with addition of potassium. I, we couldn't get it for all the survey from all over the world. And look at this. It looks like somebody sitting in air condition, taking donuts and coffee and making these, these recommendation system. But the consequences are very bad. Look at the next one. This is the consequences. We put for the last, from 1940, 10, which we didn't update it yet to the other stuff, but look at K input is red and removal is, everything come from the soil and how much useless we put K inputs, which is 66,000 tons per year on average for 40 years. And the current cost of more than 50 million per year, this is just for Illinois. I'm not talking about Iowa, Ohio, Midwest, all over the United States, Canada, and then go all over the world. So this is all paid by the poor farmers. Instead of putting them into business, they are destroying them. With this, I will finish and I would be waiting to have a couple of questions. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. That uh, that's good stuff. All I can say is I'm glad we're not putting any potassium on our fields. That's that's uh, that's some pretty brutal stuff there, uh, folks. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box or the question and answer box, um, and we'll sure get those over to Richard and Saeed. Uh, Dale, I'm going to let you ask the first question or two here. Okay. Um... The Illinois soil nitrogen test, can you compare and contrast that to the Haney test for nitrogen? Um, there are similarities. We're, we're targeting an organic fraction of N. Uh -huh. And yeah. the Haney test is looking at soil quality and the microbial component. We are too in a chemical, in a chemical way. The ISNT is simpler than the Haney test. It's easier to run, it's quicker to turn around. And uh, it, it just makes for an easier approach to vary end rates. And, and that's gonna be the main use of it. How many university, how many testing labs, university, private, are using the Illinois soil testing or Illinois um, nitrogen test? I have to admit, I don't know an exact number for okay, you. I have a couple of, but not, but previously when I came as a student 30, 40 years, 30 years back, there was 42 tests they were doing soil testing. And now for when we invented the annoying test, N test, I think one is Smith, one is, you know, the- Rick Mendel. Rick Mendel Hull, and then what the Gale, the, the Gale who was running. The Georgia? Test, Georgia, yeah. I think three so, or four at the most, not much. Yeah, it, 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 so Extension did some evaluations of it back some 10, 15 years ago. And those didn't play out so well because 
they kind of had to have a one dimensional view of how to interpret the test values. And, and so it had to be the original calibration with 230 parts per million. They did one study where they had uh, looked at it with sites going from Nebraska over to, I think, uh, Indiana or Ohio. Well, climate is tremendously variable within that, and, yeah. within that depth kind of range. Depth of also and it's going to affect microbial activities. They were also taking samples six inches and then 12 inches and then different 10 years back. So they thought that soil would just stay the same. And, and so, another, uh, another problem was that no attention was given to plant population in some of those studies. And that's critical. It's critical for determining in demand. And that's going to affect the critical level. So if you have a higher population, the critical level shifts upward. They were yep. looking for a magic pills, that one simple thing and everything will be solved. No, you have to adjust the populations, the time of sampling, everything. And uh, that they have a lot of went into a lot of problems. So, so just a comment as well that the more recent trend with extensions preference is toward biological testing with incubations. That kind of approach will take at least one week. And it can go much, much longer than that with aerobic tests. Those are not practical approaches for making an end recommendation. Uh, so I'll test it, it. It's just not going to work. It was tried years ago at Iowa State. They dropped it. it you need something that's much quicker. And I, and I might add also that we currently have a project where we are going to simplify the test procedure for the ISNT. And that should make it even more practical to run routinely. Richard, how, how much does the, the soil contribution of nitrogen, how much have you seen that change on soils that you would say have better soil health, you know, whether they had a cover crop or more diverse rotation or livestock integration? How have you seen that nitrogen contribution change based on better soil health? Um, Again, it's not something I that we have worked on ourselves. That's a hugely important question, and it needs it needs focused research. Different cover crops will have different effects. Um, the use of, of, for example, cereal rye or annual rye, that's going to be very different from uh, a leguminous cover crop. Mm -hmm. But no doubt, it will affect. The ISN, what the ISNT measures, and it will affect how we need to interpret the test results. Uh, but we need data. More data, much more data are needed to address those kind of questions. Management is a very important, crucial part of uh, the soil depleting or soil buildup, and particularly when what you put in the in the grain legumes or just legumes like alfalfa or soybean, they also differences. Several things that come tell and no till cover crops, how deep you go, what type of climate. So there's a lot of variables out there. There has to be included. But yes, if you have under good management, putting manure uh, rotation, uh, I think nitrogen that, pro that the bile pool is building up. Yeah, we have seen the data. I might add a note here that uh, within the last month, we had had occasion to sample an organic site just north of campus here, where we're doing some other work. And those ISNT values <laughs> range from around 250 to 350 in the surface six inches. I mean, it looks to me like it's building up and that was not a great soil. It was the same type of soil that Saeed mentioned for his father-in-law. The series name is Swigert. Yeah. And well, yet that uh, ISNT was, was really up there in the non-responsive range. Hmm. So they should be able to grow a pretty good crop with no added nitrogen on that. We, we would think so. But again, yeah. that, was, that was only a six inch sample. The ISNT came from 12 inch sampling. And as you go deeper, you'll dilute the test level, it'll go down. So it's a little bit, a little bit uh, comparing apples and oranges. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, we're we're running short on time here, but Dale, do you have a question or two for Saeed on on the the potassium bomb yeah, that he sure. dropped on us here? Um, yeah, I mean, we kind of pointed out the uh, the inadequacies of our current potassium soil test that it only measures exchangeable K, only measures the top six inches. How I mean, we do have soils that are potassium responsive in places at times, how would you design a better potassium test? Okay, if generally speaking, you design a test where you have a static fraction, or uh, there you cannot design test for potassium particularly because exchangeable is constantly coming, non-exchangeable is constant coming out and, and any deficiency come or not leaching, but crop uptake, it's come more and more. And it's, it's not like nitrogen or phosphorus. They don't need microbe, they don't need pH, they just need water and the roots that they can take it. So if anything is static, you can design. But if it's non-static, it's constantly coming out like spring or any, anything which is coming continuously, you cannot have a test. But the only thing you can do that if you can go where you have intense leaching, you can use a little bit potassium chloride, but possibilities are you will affect your crop quality as well as yield. I would recommend potassium sulfate, but not more than 20 or 30. And they would go and put a little bit in the farmers know, this is my good soil, this is my bad soil, just a line or two reduce 20 or 30 or 10 or no, see the difference what you get. Yeah, the same with chloride if somebody take risk, you can put it with no, no some place in different part of the field where you know historically yield go up and down, just put a two or three, a, a little bit, you know, potassium 20 below the level which you are putting for the whole, I would, I would, I would guarantee you if somebody lose, I will pay for it. That's what I did with my father-in-law. <laughs> that if you lose, I will pay. And he agree and he he increases you, but he's not giving me anything. <laughs> 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 so don't worry because that's why I show you the data. How much potassium is. Yeah. So Saeed, you're saying that if if you do need to add a little potassium, do potassium sulfate because the chloride is Correct, what's yeah doing a lot of the negative effects in those studies that you're showing. Correct. And that should not be 60 or 80. It should be 10, 15, 20. That's it. Mm -hmm. Just side. And you can do your own experiment instead of testing because just go a little bit, put strip that trial. dose strips. Strip trial. Yeah, strip trial in your own because if you are a farmer and your hands are really, really like not mine because we are all, we never go to the field. They are soft. And any farmer, they, they work hard they know their field, yeah. They can just say, hey, this is my good soil. I get 180 bushel. This is my bad soil for whatever reason, 90. Just put a little bit trial that what you can get from them, yeah. After five years, four years, and then you can, testing is just wasting time for potassium particularly. Mm -hmm. Unless it's soil is one-to-one -one clay or sandy that you can see how much, but two-to-one, which is all United States is mostly a very good soil. I would say don't don't waste your time. All right, Dale, you got anything else? Uh, I have one final question. Um, I've I've heard a theory that uh, under no-till cover crops uh, management that increases soil aggregation, the, yes. the size of the soil aggregates that uh, once an aggregate gets bigger than about 10 millimeters in diameter, um, the, the oxygen use from the microbes will create a, an anaerobic core inside those that provide habitat for free living nitrogen fixing bacteria, Azotobacter, Azospirillum, mm -hmm. and that may be contributing to some of these people seeing no response to fertilizer nitrogen. Can you address that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. 
and it's one that's prompted a current project we have underway uh, looking at. I saw that. That's why I asked. <laughs> oh, how about that? So yes, we're excited about that possibility as well. And uh, in conjunction with measuring asymbiotic into fixation, we have treatments involving calcitic limestone and gypsum, which are hopefully going to help build those aggregates and improve the environment for fixation. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to checking on what happens with those treatments uh, in the coming years. I would also be interested in mycorrhizal fungi for the glomalin production. Uh huh. To yes. Improve yes. aggregation. Yes, correct. So, you know, it, it you go out of the box, not the extension way, out of the box, and get see the data. Then you you will come somewhere, a nice place, and you will benefit the farmers community and citizen of this country yeah because we are at this point we have given some pre not scientific but this you have to do this yeah That's so it sounds idea. like dale it sounds like we have a webinar topic for a year or two down the road to have an update on that uh, current project there so that, that, <laughs> that sounds like it <laughs> sounds like a good I, one there so i would tune richard in. And, and saeed thank you very much for sharing your valuable time and your insights and your research uh, really good stuff that we'll have to kind of digest this a little bit. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, thank you if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you have additional questions, uh, you can email us here at Green Cover and we'll get those passed on to Richard and to Saeed and try to get any answer. So uh, thanks again for joining everybody. This is our last webinar of this uh, series. Uh, we will likely have some more after the first of the year. We haven't quite set that schedule yet. Uh, but we'll be letting everybody know what that looks like. So thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of the week, and uh, Merry Christmas coming up. Okay. Thank thanks, you. Keith. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks, guys. Dale.